This is going to be another part of the Taking Notes in Your Bible series. And this time we're going to look, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 2 and look at the church of Ephesus. So Revelation 2, 1, it says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So let's look at that. Angel of the church. And seven stars. Now in the Bible, stars are also angels. And back in Revelation 1.20... It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And a reference I have down with that is in Amos 5 8, Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion. You see, a lot of people get so far out there and into talking about angels. All they want to talk about is angels. They got a vision from an angel. They seem to talk about angels more than they talk about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one that made the angels. So seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion. He made the seven stars. He holds them in his right hand, it says there in Revelation 2 1. Now it also says who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And that takes you back to Revelation one twenty. What is the seven candlesticks? It says, And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So Jesus walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And there's other times Jesus walked in the Bible. I wrote these references down. Other times Jesus walked. You know, there's songs about how Jesus walked. The filthy mouth rapper Kanye West has a song called Jesus Walks. A lot of people are concerned with Jesus because he's the most famous being that ever lived. He's an eternal being. He's always lived. He's always been here and always will be. But there's other times in the scriptures where he was talked about him walking. For example, in Matthew 4, 18 and 19, it says, "...in Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee..." saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting an net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So the God who made everything came down and walked by the Sea of Galilee and picked out men to follow him and said, Follow me to them. Can you imagine seeing Jesus walk by and him saying, Follow to follow him? What an honor that would be. Well, he's doing that to you today. I mean, he's not walking down here physically, but he's wanting you to follow him. He's looking at you right now and wanting you to follow him. And then there's another verse showing Jesus walking. In Matthew 14, 25, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. So that's another time Jesus walked. He walks on the water. And you know that famous song, He Walks on the Water. You know, there's a lot of songs about Jesus walking. And then to get baptized by John, he walked. In John 136, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. When I see the verses like that, it just reminds me, Jesus Christ left heaven to come down here and walk. He didn't ride. He walked. He walked everywhere he was going. And... We should walk with him, just like Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. Are you walking with the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, verse 1, it talks about, as I said, those golden candlesticks. That takes you back to Revelation one twenty, And then Revelation 2 and verse 2. It says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And has found them liars. So let's look at works. That word works. What are works? Works are the good things that you do. Or the bad things you abstain from doing. That's your works. And uh, you don't want to be an evil worker. The Bible talks about evil workers. There's men that go around doing bad things. Those are bad works. Uh, works that you do with 
the wrong motive are really not good works. That's bad works. But works are important for us because of the judgment seat of Christ. And I talk about the judgment seat of Christ all the time because I feel like people don't bring it up much. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians don't know what the judgment seat of Christ is. I know most of my listeners probably know what the judgment seat of Christ is, but for the sake of those who don't, I always mention it because it's one of the greatest things you can tell a Christian to make them want to live right. But in 1 Corinthians three eleven through 15, it really it will really describe for you the judgment seat of Christ and how your your works do matter. The things that you do after salvation do matter. And you're going to get rewards or you're going to suffer loss of rewards depending on your good works and what sort they are. Meaning, what was the motive behind doing those good works? So it is important to maintain those works. And then I wrote some references down about works. Titus 3.14 And let ours also learn to maintain good works. For necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. So we need to maintain them. Don't just do one here and one there. We need to maintain them. It's important. Works are important because of God's plan. It's God's plan for us to have them. In Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So it does matter how we dress. It does matter how we live. It does matter how we live our life. It does matter how in our dealings with other people. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10 says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with bordered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. If you're going to profess godliness... Then walk the walk. Don't just don't just talk the talk. You need to walk the walk as well. Because people look at your walk more than your talk. First Timothy six, seventeen and eighteen. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works. It's better to be rich in good works than to be rich. Because you got a lot of money. You may be poor. You may live in a one-bedroom apartment with no car, no name-brand foods, no name-brand clothes. But you can be rich in good works. And the Bible will tell you how to be rich in good works. Because in 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Truly furnished unto all good works. So the Bible will show you how to do good works. And you should show a pattern of them. Not just one here, one there. Not just sometimes living good, sometimes not living so good. You need to show a pattern of good works. And if people see those, that's really going to give you a good testimony. Titus 2, seven, and all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 12, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. It does matter how you live in front of people. Now, verse 2 also, also talks about their labor, the church of Ephesus, their labor. So let's look up the word labor in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 3, 8, it says, Now he that planteth and that he that watereth are one, and every one, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. That's back to that judgment seat of Christ thing. People hate that word labor today. But if you want to make out good at the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to have to labor and labor with the right motive. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hebrews 6, 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name. 
and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. God's not going to forget your labor of love. Labor of love towards Him, not yourself. You don't want to do all your good works for yourself because you love yourself and you want the praise of men and you desire the praise of men more than the praise of God. It's the labor of love, it says, which you have showed toward His name. It needs to be toward him, not towards you, not towards making yourself a name like they tried to do back there at the Tower of Babel. They said, let us make us a name. You want to exalt his name and he'll make you a good name. And it says in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. It's about other people. It's about God and it's about other people. Don't make it about you. How is your motive for your good works and your labor? And verse 2 in Revelation 2, 2 also says patience. He knows their patience. And in Luke 21, 19, it says, In your patience possess ye your souls. In Revelation 14, 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You see, um, in the tribulation, the church is gone. There's an element of the law coming back. They're going to have to keep the Sabbath. You know, in Matthew 24, it says, Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. And the saints in the, in the, in the trib, they're going to have, the, the Jews, they're going to have to, they're back on that Sabbath stuff. It says, Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In Revelation 14, 12, that's the patience of the saints. Now, in verse 2, it also says, Can't you not bear? So, they're intolerant of some things. They can't bear some things. And if you're living in America right now in 2021, there's some things you're having a hard time tolerating and bearing because people are becoming more and more godless, more and more crazy by the day. And in Romans 16, 17, and 18, it says, Now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So there's some people out there that you shouldn't bear, that you shouldn't tolerate. And you many times you have to mark that person and avoid them. So he says in Revelation 2, 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. They can't they canst not bear them which are evil. Evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We're seeing it worse and worse as time goes on. Men are getting worse. And God is commending the church of Ephesus for their intolerance. They cannot bear them which are evil. In Proverbs 29, 27, it says, An unjust man is an abomination to the just, and he that is upright in the way is abomination to the wicked. These unjust men who hate your God, that hate your Bible, should be an abomination to you. You shouldn't go out and buy their CD and listen to it. Taylor Swift is, is an abomination. Her music supports godless Wicked lifestyles. She's completely godless. She is should be an abomination to the just. And because, I mean, your, your way of life, your way of thinking, if you're a Bible believer, you're an abomination to her. She hates your way of life. And she's got that song saying, you need to calm down. As, they, as she says in the song, you don't need to come out against this wicked world. It says, an unjust man is an abomination to the just, and he that is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. Why is it that you're an abomination to her how you really think, but yet she's not an abomination to you? You still listen to her music and her CDs. Intolerance is what gets Christians' heads cut off. They won't get along with the plans of the devil's men. And that's what's so good about the church of Ephesus. He commends them for their intolerance. And now next look at that word apostles in the verse. In Revelation 2 and verse 2. 
It says in Revelation 2 and verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how, can, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. There's a lot of false teachers out there saying that they're apostles, and they're not. And in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen through 15, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. But they're really not. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So these apostles, they're making you think that they're just, make a lot of people think they're just great. But they're really evil. They look the part, they talk the part, but they're really evil. And the church of Ephesus canst not bear them which are evil, and has tried them which say that they are apostles and are not. And now that next word, liars, they found them liars. What about that word in the Bible? Romans 3, 4 says, let, uh, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. Every man is a liar. I'm a liar, you're a liar. You can lie with a facial expression. Now some people are more liars than others. Some people have a extreme serious problem with lying some people lie to get ahead some people lie to get your money that's what these false apostles are doing first john 2 22 says who is a liar but he that denieth that jesus is the christ he is an antichrist that deny the father and the son so the jehovah's witnesses muslims they're liars who is a liar but he that denieth that jesus is the christ he is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Anybody who's telling you that Jesus Christ is not God is a liar and an antichrist. And I would mark that person, avoid that person, and get as far away from that person as you can. I mean, it takes more than an average sinner to just come out and say, Jesus is not God. That's getting into some very wicked spiritual sins there revelation 2 3 it says and has born and which means carried and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted and it says for my name's sake matthew 5 11 and 12 it says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So the church of Ephesus is doing some things for his name's sake. They're being persecuted. As he talked about in Matthew 5.11, he said, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. If you're doing things for Jesus' sake, this is how you're going to do good at the judgment seat of Christ. Acts 9.16, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Talking about Paul there. Paul was going to suffer a lot for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how much are you suffering for his name? Our Galatians 6, 9. It says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And then in Proverbs 24, 10, it says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. So, are you fainting are you enduring hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ? You want to keep going. The devil's going to try to get you to quit. He's going to try to get you to faint in the day of adversity. In Revelation 2, 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So this is, so he's commended the church of Ephesus. Now he's going to give some criticism. And the fact that he says against thee, that shows that there's always room for improvement. No matter how good it looks like you're doing and how good it looks like you may be, there's always room to improve because there's a perfect man and he's Jesus Christ and you're never going to be as perfect as him. So there's always going to be room to improve. In 2 Corinthians 7 1, it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit 
perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So you want to perfect your holiness. Ephesians 4.12 says, For the perfecting of the saints. God gave some apostles and some teachers and some evangelists and pastors for the perfecting of the saints. So if you want to perfect yourself, start listening to somebody that knows more Bible than you do and perfect yourself. Start listening to somebody that knows how to live, tell you how to live. Start reading the Bible. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. He said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. So there's room for improvement. There's some things that need to be perfected. He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Who is their first love? It's Jesus. In 1 John 4.19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus is their first love. And then it says in Revelation 2.5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So, let's look at that word fallen in, in verse 5. And Jude 24 says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So, who's able to keep you from falling? The Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Remember. Go back and remember how, how good it was when you were living for the Lord, when you read the Bible, when you prayed, and you cared about your first love. And it says there in, uh, in verse 5, repent. He said, repent and do the first works. So change your mind. Change your direction. Change your mind about what you're doing. And forsake your sin. Confess and forsake your sin. Do the first works. Matthew twelve forty one. The men of Nineveh repented. It says the men of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonas. So what about those first works? What are the first works? That would be the works that... We talked about when he was commending them in, in verses 2 and 3, their works, their labor, their patience, and how they can't snap bear them which are evil and tried the, the false apostles and had patience and labored for his name's sake. And then he says, I will come unto thee quickly. So what about that word quickly? He says it in a bunch of other places. In Revelation 2.16 it says, Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Revelation 3.11 Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Revelation 22.7 Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophets of this book. Revelation 22.12 And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation 22.20 He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. So he's coming quickly. Revelation 2, 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So hate. Let's look at that word. That's a strong word. That's a rough word for a lot of people. But there are things that the Lord hates. In Proverbs six sixteen through 19, he names them. And he hates the deeds of these Nicolaitans. That's the people that put the clergy over the laity. They put the teacher so far ahead of the people he's teaching to. They put the pastor so far ahead of the people that's sitting and listening to him. And the church of, of Pergamos had this doctrine as well. It says in Revelation 2.15, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Revelation 2.15 so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So God hates the idea of the clergy over the laity. Uh, he doesn't want someone lording over the flock. 
any man can get a King James Bible and learn it just as good as anybody else. There's nobody that's superior. There's nobody that you have to go to to where you would have to learn it from them. God can teach you. Now, God uses men, pastors and teachers. That's God's gift to us. But um, when it comes to a man telling you that you have to come to him to know the Bible, this is something that God hates. The clergy over the laity. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That a certain man is better than all the other people. Revelation 2, 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, what about that overcome, overcometh? Me and you have already overcome, because we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. The moment me and you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, we became overcomers. And then there's other places here in Revelation where he's talking to the churches, and he also tells them to overcome. In Revelation 2.11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Revelation 2.26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Revelation 3, 5, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Revelation 3, 12, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Revelation 3.21 To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. But in Revelation 2.7 to the church of Ephesus, he says, And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, we've already overcame because we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, doctrinally, to the tribulation saints, they're going to be eating off of a tree to get eternal life, which is different. Me and you got it through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to be eating off of a tree. Now, let's look at that tree of life. In Genesis 2, 9, it says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So that tree of life has been around since Genesis 2 or before. In Revelation 22, 2, in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Notice that tree of life all the way out there in eternity. In Revelation 22, 2, who's going to be eating off the tree? Not me and you. Me and you already have eternal life. We don't need healing anything else we done got it and when we get our glorified bodies at the rapture we're, we're set we're not going to have to eat off of a tree revelation twenty two fourteen. blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in the in through the gates into the city a lot of people have wanted to get rid of these verses about the tree of life because they say well we got our eternal life through Jesus, which we did. So they're saying that this is um, in error or something. But they're just forgetting that it's somebody else that's eating off the tree of life, not people from the church age, not born-again believers. And if you remember that, then you're not going to think that you got to change anything or that there's some type of error going on. It's not us that has to eat off the tree. You see, there's going to be people, tribulation saints, who don't get glorified bodies. You're going to have their children, 
who don't get glorified bodies. You're going to have millennial saints and their children who don't get glorified bodies. They're going to be the ones who have to eat off of a tree. Not us. Okay, Revelation 2, 7. And I will give to him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay, let's look at that word paradise. Jesus told the dying thief in Luke 23, 43, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now where was Jesus going for those three days and three nights when he died on the cross? After he died on the cross, he went into the heart of the earth. He said, As Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, and he told the, the dying thief right before he died, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So either paradise was in the heart of the earth at one point, or there's more than one paradise. And we know that it uh, moved, or there's more than one, because in 2 Corinthians 12, 3 and 4, Paul says, I knew, a man, I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was, he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. And we know that Paul went to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12. So we know that by this point, paradise was either moved to the third heaven or there's more than one paradise. And I don't profess to know that for sure. But this has been taking notes in your Bible for the church of Ephesus and Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 7.